Hello and welcome to our massive open online course on language and emotion at work. We are a research group based at the UNED in Madrid, uh, in Spain, of course, but um, with members from several other uh, countries and universities uh, in Spain and all over the world, such as Universidad de Alcalá, Universidad de Alicante, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, Universidad de Castilla-La Mancha, King's College London in the UK, University of Liverpool in the UK, Texas A&M University in the US, VU Un University Amsterdam in the Netherlands, or um, RMIT in Melbourne, Australia. As you see, we have uh, different members from different parts of the world, and I think that this will make the course very exciting. Uh, and all throughout the course, we shall try to answer questions such as, what is the relationship between language and emotion, between also linguistic evaluation and emotion, or between emotion and language learning and teaching? What about emotion and gender? And about emotion and persuasion? Can language be devoid of emotion? How is emotion really expressed in language? How is emotional intelligence shown through language in working environments? And from there, the title of this MOOC, which is Emotion at Work, because we have concentrated um, on uh, mainly uh, the discourse of uh, institutional and corporate uh, you know, uh, environments, and so that we are trying to see how emotions are managed and how they are expressed in working environments. Uh, it is, I wanted to, before starting with uh, the um, explanations and with the presentation of the whole course, I just wanted to quote or to make a reference to the psychologist, uh, PhD Wayne Dyer, who in, his, in one of his books, in one, one of his many books, uh, which is uh, titled Wishes Fulfilled, he says the following. Years ago, while teaching at several major, major universities, I'd ask graduate students this question. What do you respond to first? What you know or how you feel? I wanted them to determine which domain captured their primary attention. For instance, on the cognitive level, the analyzing ability, mathematical prowess, prowess, mastery of the rhyming scheme of an Elizabethan sonnet, or ability to memorize scientific formulas. On the feeling level, loneliness, sadness, fear, heartbreak, anxiety, love, ecstasy, joy, and so on. All, all of them, reported that feeling level was primary. You most likely will agree that how you feel takes precedence over what you know. Affect rules over cognition. Formal educational experiences, however, are almost exclusively devoted to the way, the what you know, sorry, aspect of your being and not the how you feel aspect. And this is something and a very important uh, aspect that we're going to deal with in this course. Okay, so now. Why emotion in language? Well, because emotions are a key factor in the comprehension of human nature. The topic has been and is being explored from different perspectives and within different fields of knowledge. Psychology, sociology, linguistics, philosophy, etc. And that's why we thought it was a very interesting topic to deal with because uh, now in the 21st century uh, is uh, on the, let's say, uh, it's, it's a high topic, it's a hot topic, and uh, everyone from different fields, they are starting to study uh, emotions. So they are a key factor in the comprehension, but not only of human nature, but also of human language and communication. Mm, and linguistics and cognitive linguistics are concerned with the conceptualization and the expression of emotion as a natural function of language. 
So as I said, in the 21st century, because in the 20th century the uh, accent was more on the referential uh, function of language, but in the 21st century there, has, there is or there's been a polyphonic rise of emotivity in every scientific field, uh, which can be considered a paradigm shift. And that's why we speak of the emotional turn in linguistics because linguistics is our main field of concern, although, as I said, we also have psychologists, sociologists, and philosophers in the group. Now, some features of the emotional turn in linguistics are, as I said before, that the rationalistic paradigm now uh, has, uh, or is being supplemented by the, an emotion-integrating integrating paradigm. Linguistic homogeneity is supplemented by linguistic heterogeneity. The acceptance of linguistic norms is supplemented by an openness to transgression. Linguistic linearity is now being supplemented by spatialization. And arbitrariness is being supplemented by motivatedness. So it's not that we're not paying attention to cognition and to, to uh, the rationalistic view, but we are also supplementing it uh, with um, the emotive or the emotion integrating paradigm or, or the, and view. Now there is a controversy among experts from different disciplines as to whether human emotions are universal or are culturally, culturally bound. In this introduction we're not going to discuss uh, this in depth but just let's look at some examples such as mm, mm, interjections in this case. In English uh, when you feel pain Normally you say ouch or ow, whereas in Spanish you say I. So even in, in interjections uh, which are considered to be direct expressions of emotion because you just directly express and you supposedly you do not conceptualize very much uh, what you're going to say because you're just directly expressing what you feel, there are differences from one language to the other. So it seems that we adapt mm, our expression to the phonology at least, or to you know, the different characteristics of the language we are speaking. Uh, then also, the, there are differences in, in the concepts. Uh, the concept uh, in Spanish of vergüenza ajena, for instance, uh, does not find equivalence in other languages. In English, we probably can speak about cosmic or vicarious embarrassment, but there are languages in which this um, concept is not found, which doesn't mean that the people don't feel it. It's just that they are not or they have not been conceptualized in language and that's the difference because in fact we uh, do not know, uh, we cannot say whether which emotions are universal and which are not, mm, but we can speak about how they are or these emotions are expressed in language, in different languages. Some emotions appear in the linguistic repertoire of only certain languages, as I said, mm, and not others. For instance, Japanese amae mm, is the feeling that you get from surrendering to another in perfect safety. I don't think we have a, an equivalent concept in English or in Spanish or even in French, I'm not sure, but um, this is a, an emotion that the Japanese for some reason have focused on and have given a name to. Mm. Then also the same happens with the uh, German schadenfreude, Schaden, I think you pronounce it schadenfreude, uh, which uh, means the pleasure derived from another's displeasure. Mm. Or another term is a Czech litost, uh, which is a Czech word with no exact translation into any other language and it refers to a state of torment caused by a sudden insight into one's own miserable self. Mm? Litost works like a two-stroke motor. First comes a feeling of torment and then a desire for revenge. So it's a combination here of torment and revenge in just one concept or word, litost, um, which I don't think we have in Spanish or in English either. Uh, then our research group and project, Emma Fundet, which is a project uh, funded by the Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness in, in Spain, 
mainly takes a linguistic, discursive, pragmatic perspective to the study of emotion, with the intention of clarifying and somehow systematizing the study of the expressive function of language, which we consider to be related to the different discursive stances, or related to the evaluative function, taken by the speakers of a language in particular. And in, sorry, and in particular, we look into the institutional or corporative, corporative, corporative discourse of people at work. For we have observed that the management of emotions and emotive discourse is crucial in any kind of work environment. And consequently, <coughs> we believe <coughs> sorry, that there is a relationship between evaluation and emotion, the evaluative function of language and the emotive or expressive function of language. And we base this assumption and much of, uh, on, uh, yes, and much of our work on our previous findings within the funded project, one of whose results was the book Evaluation in Context. There, in particular, in the previous project, we uh, focused on the evaluative uh, function of language, but we realize that there is a very close relationship between evaluation and emotion, although we do not believe that they are both the same. Hmm? Mm, normally, we uh, make an evaluation of things or of a situation, and then this evaluation triggers the emotion. We think, so suppose that you, um, uh, I don't know, you see a scorpion, and so, you evaluate that that is a dangerous animal and therefore you feel fear. Mm? That is one of the kind of relationships that you find between evaluation and emotion. Then at the same time we understand and in line with psychological studies such as Rick, uh, Ames and Orschner that emotion regulation is essential for maintaining mental health social functioning and physical well-being. Hence our interest in exploring not only the linguistic manifestation of human emotion, but also its relationship to so-called emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And here we've seen different authors such as Goldman, who was you know, the author of the first book <coughs> entitled Emotional Intelligence, <coughs> Petridis, um, Perez Gonzalez and Furtham, in, uh, also a very interesting article about emotional intelligence in 2007. Now, what is the place of emotion in language? We see the conceptualization and the expression of emotion as a pragma linguistic phenomenon which shows the relationship brain, body, world within a dynamical system. Mm -hmm and uh, which is expressed in the cyclic mm, relationship, sense, act, and think. So we act or we think something, therefore we sense in a certain way, and then we act in another certain way. But this is like a circle, and all these elements affect, affect uh, one another. Now, of course, what we believe also is that language and cognition interact. This is the assumption of cognitive scientists, such as Slobbing or Pinker or Casasanto. So what they think is that the way human cognition works influences the structure of human language and vice versa. Cognition is then strongly connected to both language and emotion. Okay, so that was a general introduction of our you know, general beliefs and, and, and our questions and why we are here, you know, doing this course and why we want to, in a way, show and spread the knowledge about our research on the relationship on language and emotion. So, in this online course, we will examine and you will be able to explore topics such as the expression and the conceptualization of emotion at the different uh, linguistic levels, such as phonological, lexical, syntactic, the pragmatics of emotion, cognition, language, and emotional intelligence, linguistic management of emotions at the workplace, the relationship between humor, irony, and emotion, uh, other things such as emotion in narrative and in literary discourse, and literary and academic discourse, emotion and gender, what's the relationship between gender uses of language 
and emotion. And uh, it also, and a very interesting and important aspect of, of this uh, study has to do with the emotion, with emotion and the teaching and learning of languages, because we think there is a close, you know, a very important relationship there between emotion and learning languages and teaching languages. And also, we have a module on emotion and persuasion, because this is the main topic of the subproject of Emma Fundet, led uh, uh, by Mercedes Diaz at the University of Alcalá. Uh, and finally, we have some extra material concerning emotion in big data, which is also an interesting topic. Okay, so uh, as for the expression and conceptualization of emotion at the different linguistic levels, uh, let's look at some examples. For instance, at the morphological level, the, we know, and as you as native speakers of Spanish or English or other languages which also use diminutives, uh, you use that, uh, you know that we use diminutives to express love and affection or uh, sometimes augmentatives to express contempt or affection too. Hmm? So think for instance of English sweetie, we have the e, i-e at the end which is a diminutive which has some, you know, mm, uh, connotation of affection. Then in Spanish when we say mi amorcito or Robertito versus when we use the augmentative we say calzonazos, manazas in Spanish, uh, which uh, has some kind of a pejorative uh, connotation. Hmm? For, for instance, if we say that someone is manazas, we mean that he or she is clumsy. But sometimes the augmentative can also have a positive connotation, positive emotive connotations, as when you say amigazo, he's my amigazo, he's muy amigazo, meaning he's a good friend, or in Portuguese, amigao as well. Hmm? And also remember that the diminutive can be used in, um, to express contempt, because if I say, something like in Spanish, um, es un empleadito, you know, there I'm showing some contempt or some, uh, you know, I mean, I'm using it in a pejorative way. Mm. So this is the wonderful thing about language, that the same thing may mean so many different things that, uh, or the same element, uh, so, uh, depending on how you use it. Mm, and that's why uh, pragmatics, the study of pragmatics is so important, as we're going to see along this course as well. Right, at the lexical level, mm, we also find words with an emotional content. We normally speak about the valence of, of words. They may have a positive or a negative valence. For instance, think of the word cancer. What do you think? Of course, it has a negative valence, negative connotation, so negative, em it triggers negative uh, emotions or negative feelings. Whereas the word heart normally has a positive connotation. Heart has, is related to love, to life, to many things that are considered to be positive for human beings. But words uh, can change their valence depending on your views or cultural values as Dr. Lachlan Mackenzie is going to show us in the first part of module two. He will show us how bullfighting, for instance, or socialism may have positive or may bring about positive or negative emotions depending on what your view of the world is. Because if you are for bullfighting, you are going to think of it or express everything about bullfighting uh, within a positive emotional environment. Whereas if you don't, it would be just the opposite. The same for socialism. If you are a socialist, everything concerning socialism and every word concerning uh, uh, having to do with this uh, um, approach to life, then you would consider it, them to be positive. But if you don't, if you, if you are not keen on socialism, then of course, uh, for you, those words or expressions are going to have a negative sign. Now, another interesting aspect of voc vocabulary, uh, which goes within also the field of, or the pragmatic level of analysis, is metaphors because metaphors generally have a heavy emotional content. Suppose someone says, he drove me up the wall. This is an idiom, but it's also metaphoric because you, even, which, you use it to express anger. Hmm? 
he drove me up the wall. I was angry. Doesn't mean that you're going to go literally up the wall, but you know, it's just an image, a metaphor, to express a feeling. Or suppose someone says, meeting her was heaven on earth for me. She brightened up my day. Mm, so these metaphors brighten up and heaven on earth ex express or are used to express happiness. Or if someone says he was head over heels in love with her mm, to express deep love. Mm. And uh, it, it has been uh, shown in different studies that uh, the more metaphors uh, a text has, the more emotive it becomes. So there is a strong relationship between emotion and metaphor. Of course, at, as I said, at, uh, emotion in language can be found at all levels of linguistic description. And syntactic, the syntactic level is one of them. So we, we are going to see how the choice of a given syntactic construction or a given order of words in a sentence can have expressive connotations. Suppose uh, instead of saying it was a wonderful party, I say a wonderful party it was. Mm -hmm. This is going to be explained by uh, uh, doctors Angela Downing and Elena Martinez Caro in module two and how you know this changing of the constituents of a sentence or uh, in a sentence uh, can have strong emotive implications. Also notice expressions like the leg of the table. If you say the leg of the table, here the head of the noun phrase, the leg of the table, is leg. So it comes before uh, the, purpose, the preposition of phrase. And here we would say that this is neutral in emotion. If you say the leg of the table, you don't find any strong emotion there. Versus another noun, similar noun phrase, but if you say a bear of a man, there, the head of the noun phrase is not bear, but man. So the head of the noun phrase comes after the preposition, uh, is within the preposition of phrase, which is embedded in the, in the whole uh, noun phrase. And you will see that this second option, this, this use of um, noun phrases, this change in the, in the grammar and the syntax of a noun phrase, it has some emotive implications as well. Hmm? meaning well, he's a big man, I judge him as a big man, and also can be he's rough, uh, courageous, etc., etc. It may have um, different emotive implications. Also, of course, uh, uh, we find, as I, as, uh, I said before, uh, emotional connotations at the phonological level. And there is, a, and we all know that there is a strong relationship between prosody and emotion. This is what Lucy Pickering is going to show us in module three. She is going to speak about the relationship between intonation and emotion. Uh, for instance, how speakers use a rising tone to disagree, or uh, emotional responses to intonational choices at the workplace. And here she will deal with a, an interesting concept, which is the concept of linguistic penalty, which has to do with paying a price for having a different communication style. And she will give examples of Indian English versus American English. Why Indian people? Because they use a different intonation, for instance, for making requests. Uh, they are misunderstood by American English speakers. And, and there are lots of misfires reg uh, just coming out of this different use of the intonation of the same language, which is English in this case. Also, Marrer, uh, Drs. Victoria Marrero and um, Pilar Perez Ocon in module three will speak about the different functions of intonation. And of course, one of the most important functions is the emotive function. Uh, they will speak about the universal meanings and biological codes of intonation and the affective meanings of intonation. And now going to the pragmatic level, in module four, we're going to speak about the pragmatics of emotion. We're going to see and talk about strategies of interaction used to express emotion. For instance, politeness strategies, use of emoticons in computer-mediated communication, etc. And how all these pragmatic phenomena affect and are used by speakers in their work interactions.
so, for instance, Carmen Santa Maria will speak about emotion and politeness at the workplace. Because if you think of those of you who have studied the theories of politeness, if you come to think of it, you will see that strategies of politeness, in fact, have a lot to do with strategies of emotional intelligence. Because you are trying not to hurt or to hurt, uh, because may, you may use strategies of impoliteness, but always you know, aiming at your interlocutor's feelings when you don't want to hurt them or when, when you want to hurt them on purpose. So all the time you are taking into account feelings, your feelings and your interlocutor's feelings. Also, uh, Dr. Carmen Sancho is going to talk about emotions expressed in the reports of fatal air accidents. Mm, this is a very interesting topic, and she has a very interesting you know, topic, uh, a very interesting uh, corpus taken from these uh, black boxes of fatal air accidents. Um, then Joanne, uh, Dr. Joan Neff is going to talk about the terms of address and implicatures in academic and political work environments. And um, Dr. Carmen Maiz from the Complutense as well, she's going to use to speak about the use of emoticons in professional and academic exchanges. And finally, uh, another of the talks will be that of uh, Dr. Eva Ogerman from King's College London, who will uh, tell you interesting things about emotions in corporate responses to negative online feedback. Right, then in module five, we are going to see uh, or to you know, uh, explore the relationship between humor, irony, and emotion. How emotions are expressed through humorous and or ironic discourse in direct and indirect ways. For instance, social and personal criticism implied in a given humoristic discourse or an ironic comment. And uh, our colleague and member of EMO Fundet, Dr. Salvatore Atardo, will show us that about 10% of all conversations at the workplace are humorous and that there is extensive research which has documented mm, that uh, humor is used in the workplace for a variety of functions. And Salvatore is also going to explain to us the difference between humor and mirth, the latter, that is to say mirth, being the emotion elicited by the perception of humor. So humor and mirth are not the same thing. Uh, this, mirth is the emotion mm, elicited by humor. Uh, we also have in this module Dr. Paco Jus, member of Emo Fundet from the University of Alicante, who will explain how emotions are communicated through the phenomenon of verbal irony. And we'll look at it from the relevance theoretical perspective. So emotions are crucial mm, for the appropriate interpretation of irony and any kind of discourse because they affect both the intended he will show us not only the intended, but also the chosen interpretation. And in this module as well, our doctoral student, David Ferrer, will show us how emotions can be managed through the use of verbal humor at the workplace, as well as how humor may be connected to mental flexibility and really become a powerful tool for managing relations in a work environment. He will also look at different theories of humor and how each one of them contribute to the understanding of our emotions and emotional reactions. So as you see, uh, emotion mm, is a key factor both at the workplace and everywhere in our lives. Uh, in module six, we are going to discuss the relationship between language, cognition, and emotional intelligence. We will look into corpora of institutional and corporate discourse, such as the discourse of risk communication due to fatal air accidents, as we say that Carmen Sancho would do, to explore the relationship between emotion, cognition, and language, as well as the connection, if any, we think there is a connection, but anyway, uh, we're just investigating this, between the expression of emotion and so-called emotional intelligence. We will also interview experts on emotion and emotional intelligence, linguists, psychologists, education professionals, etc., to look into the phenomenon from different perspectives. 
uh, Juan Carlos Perez Gonzalez, for instance, will show us how emotional intelligence mm, is a personal characteristic that affects communicative competence and how these two are among the top ten, these two I mean emotional intelligence and communicative competence, mm, and how they are among the top ten employability skills according to United States managers and the World Economic Forum. So, our main hypoth hypothesis here in this module is that emotional intelligent people are probably good communicators. So, we're trying to find the relationship between emotional intelligence and uh, communicative competence, how it is reflected in language. In this same module, Joan Neff will talk to us about the feeling of empathy and its connection to emotional intelligence. Excuse me. She will show us how managers and executives with high cognitive and emotional empathy perform better than those who do not have that empathy because, for instance, and among other things, they become aware of the unspoken norms of a different culture. That's one thing that you are able to uh, perceive when you are emotionally intelligent. Mm? So uh, emotional intelligence, as we see in that uh, drawing there, is related to increased team performance, increased leadership ability, improving decision making, decreased occupational stress, and reduced staff turnover. Uh, in module seven now, we are going to explore the relationship between emotion and literary and academic discourse. How emotion uh, is manifested or is expressed in these two uh, discourse types. Mm. Gender, we will see, we'll look at gender within embodied knowledge and how it affects the use of language from the professional to the creative writing domain. This uh, will be mainly explained by our colleague and member of EMO Fundet as well, Dr. Isabel Castellao, who is uh, you know, an expert in literary discourse. Uh, we'll also explore the use of academic discourse by men and women in cultural and literary studies, and the use of spatial metaphors by men and women in academic discourse, and how they relate to emotive constructs of femininity and masculinity. Also, she will uh, tell us about the current cross-gender, the expression of emotion in the literary and cultural market in Western societies. N and uh, also, she will look at under-emotional discourses for women and over-emotional discourses for men. And uh, she will also touch on topics such as the tenets of feminist translation. Mm -hmm the feminist translation theory, which re reconsider the relation of emotion, language and gender in the professional field of literary translation. Uh, in the penultimate module, we will deal with a very important aspect of uh, the relationship between emotion and language, which has to do with emotion and the teaching and learning of languages. Uh, we will look into the effective factors linked to the learning or teaching of a foreign language because we consider this is a very important aspect to include in this course for as some authors such as Tival uh, or Macan, Macan uh, entire observe emotion has not been given sufficient attention in the second language learning literature and it might just be the fundamental basis of motivation for, learn for learning a language in the first place. Uh, for instance, the people who teach English in our group have noticed that emotion in the, uh, is in the English language text textbooks is, tot is almost, I would say, inexistent. Mm. Uh, the, uh, these textbooks do not include mm, emotive language or emotive uh, expressions mm, uh, within their, their syllabus or within their, the units mm, that they develop. It is hard then, we think, to socialize or to function in any language using emotionless 
textbook phrases like, I don't know, I remember one of the older times that I always repeat, like, my tailor is rich, you know. No, we have to make our students, when we teach a foreign language, we have to make them aware of the fact that emotions uh, affect the way we communicate. And depending on how we use one expression or the other, or one uh, syntactic construction or the other, etc., we are going to transmit or we are going to show or to elicit a different kind of emotion. Mm. So that has to be taken into account. So this is one of the topics for further future research for all of you if you want to write a textbook. I know that there are some people who have started to work on this. Uh, I recently was at a, a conference in Argentina where um, an interesting, uh, you know, a researcher showed me a book for teaching English where emotion uh, was the concern and it was considered in all the units, but there are not enough textbooks that uh, take this uh, aspect into consideration. So this is what I want to remark here. Mm. And uh, within, you know, the field of language teaching and learning, the only variable that has been extensively researched is language learning motivation. Mm. Uh, but, as I said before, and as we believe, emotion is at the basis of any learning or any absence of learning. Because we all know that we, if we have a negative predisposition to a language, or we don't like the teacher, or whatever aspect that is being negative to our emotions, this will affect our learning. And, and it will uh, result in our lack of learning or a very poor learning of a language. Therefore, there is a great connection between motivation, emotion, and learning a language, which we have to explore um, in a deeper way. So in this respect, we believe that emotional learning, and in particular, the managing of emotions within language learning, contribute uh, to the personal well-being and the social success of individuals all throughout their lives. In order to see how emotion works within the language learning system, we are going to resort not only to linguistics, but also to neuroscience, psychology, learning methodology, etc. Uh, doctors Aurelia Carranza and Victoria Marrero will show us how emotion is the key for learning and ed education, and will give us a tour of the human brain to see how it works in matters of emotion. They will also give us some hints as to how to deal with emotions in the foreign language classroom, as well as to the important ethical issues that are raised in such a case. And finally, in module 9, uh, this module will be devoted to persuasion. Mm. Uh, the expression of emotion contributes to its social regulation and it can be strategically used to alter the emotional responses of another person or group of people. When you try to alter the emotional responses of another person or group of people, what you're trying to do is to persuade, mm, to convince that person or people about something that you're saying. Mm. Thus, it has been associated with the persuasive function of language ever since the ancient Greeks' studies on rhetoric. This constitutes the main focus of study of the EMO-funded persuasion sub-project, which, as I said, is led by Mercedes Diaz, and she, together with uh, Antonio Garcia Gomez and Javier de Santiago Verbos, uh, will talk about the relevance of emotion, pathos, in persuasion, an aspect that uh, was pointed out way back in the fourth century before Christ by Aristotle in his treatise, The Art of Rhetoric. And uh, Aristotle also grounded persuasion on two other appeals that play a decisive role, building your credibility, ethos, and using logical arguments or reasons, logos. Logos targets our brain. Emotion carries a heavy load in every persuasive act, and when used in isolation with the sole aim of convincing our audience, it can be considered fallacious and even manipulative. Or manipulative. For that reason, we devote a part of the persuasion module to dealing with fallacious arguments that try to persuade the audience by arousing their feelings such as fear or pity, 
but which lack logical or sound reasons. So to conclude, this main, the, this general introduction to the MOOC. When people feel emotions, they do not only make their internal states visible, but also perform linguistic actions which are interpersonal in nature and have particular consequences. By doing so, human beings reveal and at the same time affect certain aspects of the cognitive and social systems they form part of. There is perhaps nothing more human than the verbal expression of emotion. Animals may express certain basic emotions in nonverbal ways, but they cannot talk about them. So that's why we say it's a very human characteristic. So I will end my talk by uh, quoting McIntyre and Gregerson when they say that positive emotion facilitates the building of resources because positive emotion tends to broaden a person's perspective, opening the individual to absorb the language. And that's why we think that there is a strong connection between emotion and language and that if we polish our language, if we learn the strategies of a given language, we can be more not only communicatively competent but also emotionally competent and we can perform better in different environments, not only work environments but, environments, but also uh, educational environments. So um, now uh, we invite you because this is the end of this presentation, but we invite you to check for the extra material in this and also the other modules after watching the corresponding videos where you will be able to find the PowerPoint presentations for each one of them as well as the articles, as articles or websites related to the topics covered. And interesting, also we are going to uh, uh, include in the different modules uh, interesting interviews with experts on emotion coming from different fields of knowledge, mainly linguistics, but also psychology, sociology, and we'll also have experts on education from Spain and different parts of the world, such as Ignacio Bosque, who, you know, is a member of the Spanish Royal Academy of Language, Lachlan Mackenzie, one of the forefathers of the functional discourse of the uh, approach to uh, grammar called uh, functional discourse grammar, Salvatore Atardo, who is a world expert on humor studies, uh, then many others like Eva Ogerman from King's uh, College London, Elena Martinez Caro, Joan Neff, uh, Mercedes Diaz, Carmen Santa Maria, Carmen Sancho, Carmen Maiz, etc. All the members of Emma Fundet who are now, mm, you know, becoming experts on this topic as well. And um, one thing I wanted to um, uh, tell you is that the majority of the presentations are going to be. Mm, in English, but in some exceptional cases, especially when the speaker's expertise is concerned with the Spanish language, because this is a group funded, uh, you know, based in Spain, uh, then the talks or interviews were recorded in Spanish. We hope that you enjoy every single minute of it all. Thank you very much and bye for now until module two.